The next few lectures that we're going to look at, uh, the things I'm going to talk about, are probably things that are about the focus of faith in uh, people of religious, and, and even people who aren't that religious, because you still make some decisions about these matters. And uh, so in this lecture right now, I'm going to talk about the existence of God or the existence of some sort of supreme being or some sort of divine entity. And we're going to look at some traditional arguments that you find for or supporting the existence of God. And then in the next lecture or two, we're going to look at the other side of the fence. And one of the main arguments that's given against the existence of some sort of divine, all-powerful, all-loving entity or being out there. Um, so this, this, the topic for this lecture is on the existence of God. Um, if, if we consider that in three eras of time, the existence of God in ancient thought, the existence of God in the Middle Ages or medieval times, and the existence of God in modern times, we find a couple different assumptions about that. And, and I guess in talking about the existence of God, we're also talking about that that opens up the possibility of the existence of this whole other realm beyond this natural realm that we live in. If there is a God, if there's some sort of divine entity, uh, but if there is some sort of supreme being, then there's some other realm of existence beyond this that we would assume. And so when you look at ancient thought, and again, ancient thought in this case would be anything probably pre-10th, 11th century is where we would put that. It seems that there was almost an assumption that there was something else out there. There wasn't much questioning of whether there's something else out there. If you look at ancient Egyptian burial practices, for instance, people were buried with things to take into another life, into another realm. If you look at hieroglyphs or petroglyphs from ancient cultures, you, you get images that would indicate that there's something beyond this realm and that, again, often burial practices would reflect that as far as the kinds of things that people are buried with to take with them into the next life. It's not until you get to the early part of the Middle Ages or maybe a little pre-Middle Ages that people begin to say, well, how do you know there's a God? How do you know there's something else out there? We've just, we've just kind of assumed it to this point. It's kind of been a cultural belief that's influenced practices within a culture up to this point, but can you prove that there's something else out there? And so what, we're going to start out and look at two of the traditional, I guess, enduring arguments from early on in relation to whether it makes sense to believe that there's a God or not. And so from the Middle Ages... Um, first of all, I want to talk about an argument called the ontological argument for God's existence. This is an argument developed by a man named Anselm around the 11th century. And uh, as Anselm developed this ontological argument, let me say that this is an argument that is, I, th I think for, for most of us that have tried to look at and understand this argument, it's kind of circular. Uh, the second argument from the Middle Ages we're going to look at is a little more linear, and whether you agree with his conclusions or not, at least you can make some sense out of his argument. This one's a little more circular argument, but it's, it's, it's likely the oldest of the traditional enduring arguments for God's existence. So I'm going to introduce you to Anselm's ontological argument. Anselm begins this ontological argument with a premise or a presupposition, and that premise is this that if we're going to talk about whether there's a God or not, Anselm's premise was, if there is a God, one thing that we all agree on here in the 11th century is that if there is a God, then God is a being of whom none is greater. That if, if you would ask someone in the 11th century, or maybe even here in the 21st century, what they could say about God, whether there is one or not, what, what defines this idea of God, probably a lot of people would say something like, well, it's the greatest being there is. There's nothing greater than God. I mean, it's, and, and Anselm said, you can't really conceive of anything 
greater than God. Whether that's an imaginary conception or it's a, it's a real thing, when we think of God, we think of God as the greatest being that there is. And so he starts with that premise, that if there is a God, then God is a being of which none is greater. Now, let me talk through kind of four parts of his argument and try to explain what he means by that. First, Anselm says, there are necessary beings. And he, he explains that basically that there are things that have to exist. There are things that cannot not exist. They're necessary. And then he says there's contingent beings. Things that might exist, but whether they exist or not is really of no great consequence. Things that exist, but their existence is not needed. So there's some things that are necessary beings. They, they have to exist. I mean, to try to tell me that the ground that I walk on doesn't exist, you, you can't tell me that. It, it exists. I walk on it. It can't, at least at this moment, it can't not exist. Then he goes on secondly. If there is a God, now again, he's still saying we don't know whether there's one or not, but if there is one, our idea is that God is something than which nothing greater can be conceived. Okay, so back to that original premise. Okay, so now there's necessary things, things that cannot not exist, and then there are contingent things, things that whether they exist or not is not of as great a consequence. Then he says, secondly, at this point unrelating these things, but obviously he's going to relate them eventually. Then, if there is a God, our, God, our idea is that God is something that nothing greater can be conceived than God, if there is a God. Then the third thing he says is that the idea of something is inferior to its reality. The idea of something is inferior to its reality. That you can have an idea, but once it's determined that there's no reality attached to that idea, then the idea loses some of its force, or maybe all of its force and influence. The example I always give, and this is not Anselm's example, but the example I give of this is that there was probably a time in a lot of your lives when the idea of a chubby man in a red suit with a white beard held influence over your life. Your parents successfully used that idea to manipulate your behavior, at pro maybe at a certain point in your life, that idea. But once you came to understand, if there's children in the room, you might want to have them leave, but once you came to understand that there was no reality attached to that idea, then the idea didn't have any influence anymore over you. I mean, I doubt that for some of you that are kind of traditional college age, I doubt that last semester when you got midterm grades or your freshman year when you got midterm grades and they weren't that great, I doubt that any of your parents said, if you don't get your grades up, Santa's not going to bring anything. <laughs> and that idea was, is inferior to the reality that there's no idea, there's no reality attached to that idea. So an idea that has no reality does not tend to have influence, does not tend to make a difference. And that's really the direction that Anselm is going here. If there has been this idea of a being of whom none is greater that has existed throughout time, as far as he knew in the 11th century, and across cultures, there's been this idea of a being of whom none is greater. And this idea has been the source of values, beliefs, morals, social practice, within taboos, within those cultures. Then Anselm says, surely there must be a reality attached to that idea. Or it would be like Santa. It's a nice idea. We put him in our front yard as a big old balloon. Uh, and there's a time when we can make people think there's a reality attached to that idea. 
But ultimately, that idea does not hold influence or sway over people or cultures to any significant extent because the idea is inferior to the reality of an idea. And so he says, God must exist in reality. If God did not exist, then God would not be that than which nothing greater can be conceived or imagined. Or if God did not exist, then there would not be this idea of a greatest being that holds such influence over people's lives, over cultures throughout time. Because again, it's just an idea, no reality attached to it. It would lose its influence. A little circular. The second one that we're going to look at from the Middle Ages, though, is a little more linear. And again, whether you agree with his conclusions or not, uh, I think you can kind of follow his train of thought. Uh, this, is, was, this was an argument developed in the 13th century by a man named Thomas Aquinas. And this is an argument called the cosmological argument for God's existence. And um, basically what, what Aquinas was saying is that if you look at or you observe, that's the ology in the title of this argument, if you look at or observe the cosmos, everything that we know to exist, he says that, that it points to certain things that it's hard to deny if you observe the cosmos. So uh, basically the premise of this argument is that Aquinas does not attempt to prove anything about God as a first cause or as a first mover, and we'll talk about these in a minute except to argue that such a first cause must, must exist. So he looks at, actually looks at five different dynamics of the cosmos. And he says, if you look at those dynamics of the cosmos, it points, they each point to some pretty much undeniable reality. And then, of course, the conclusion at the end of all that is if you add all this up, what would fit all of these undeniable realities but God? But he's just trying to say, look at the cosmos and see some things that it tells you that it's really hard to deny. So we're going to look at these different aspects of the cosmos. So the first aspect that Aquinas looks at of the cosmos is the aspect of motion. There's a lot of movement going on. Things are spinning, rotating, revolving, pulsating. There's all this movement going on. And Aquinas says that we know that wherever there is movement, something initiated the movement. Movement doesn't just start on its own. It doesn't just happen on its own. It's not self-generated. But something has to initiate the movement. There has to be, and this is a kind of the undeniable reality part of Aquinas' argument, there has to be a first mover, a prime mover, an unmoved mover, something that can get things moving but may not need something to get it moving. But there has to be a first mover. I mean, if, I, you know, if you set up a big old domino design of the Missouri State Bear on your dining room floor and you want to show it off to people, and then uh, so the first people come over, you get to show off this design that you put together, and you take them to the dining room to show it to them, and the dominoes are scattered everywhere, you're going to jump to some probably safe conclusions. The dog did it. The younger sibling did it. And there's no denying that something had to move the dominoes. The dominoes just didn't move themselves. Maybe some of you as a child had your parents say to you after you had performed some act that you were trying to hide, things don't move themselves. You know, lights don't get shot out of the dining room light on their own. <laughs> You know, something has to cause the movement. And so Aquinas says that's true of the cosmos. You've got all this movement. There has to be something that caused the movement, a first mover, a prime mover. The second aspect of the cosmos he looks at is substance or matter. There's all this substance and matter in the cosmos. And Aquinas said, basically one of the first laws of thermodynamics, that something doesn't come from nothing. Something has to come from something else. There has to be what he calls a first cause or a first substance that everything else came from. 
And that's the whole premise of evolutionary theory and, and really one of the places where there's a lot yet to be determined in evolutionary theory. Because there's this sense, you know, evolutionary theory is the idea that something comes from something else, but there's still that question, but where did the first something come from? Where'd the first atom come from? Where'd the first energy come from? Where'd the first molecule come from? What's the source of that? And that, and that opens up a whole, again, a whole other realm of scientific theorizing and exploration. But that's the question. What was the first cause of that first piece of substance? The third aspect of the cosmos that Aquinas looks at is, is what I would call time or history. Or, or maybe events. And this is uh, what one thing that he, call, he calls this contingency necessity. Or another, two other words you might parallel with that would be dependency, independency. But it, it's, it's kind of this idea, or this is one part of that idea, that every event is contingent upon previous events. For you to be where you are right now at this moment in time, wherever that is, whatever you're doing, for you to be here, that is contingent upon a whole series of previous events. That, you know, you enrolled in this class, that you became a student at Missouri State, that you decided a career field you wanted to pursue, that you graduated from high school, that's contingent upon that you were born somewhere back there, that was contingent upon two people met and you were the product of that union, which was contingent upon both of their lives coming to the same place at the same time, maybe from totally different cultures or backgrounds. It's contingent upon... It's, and so the idea is you can take any moment of time and you can say, for me to be here right now, and you can go back and say it's contingent upon this, it's contingent upon this, upon this, upon this, all the way back to, you know, somewhere in Europe a long time ago. And what Aquinas says when he's talking about this idea of contingency necessity is he says, infinite regress is not possible. That to say this moment is contingent upon this moment, upon this moment, upon this moment, upon this moment infinity, <laughs> so it's not possible somewhere, according to Western philosophical thought, somewhere back there, there had to be a starting point. There had to be a, the independent event, the first event, the necessary event from which everything else came. So, so far he's saying you, you got to have a first mover for all the motion. You got to have a first cause for all the substance. You got to have an independent event that's the source of all other events from which time flows. Fourth, he talks about the idea of um, basically human virtue. Uh, he uses the word values, but I think the way we use those words today, virtue might make more sense for our understanding of it. And so it's what uh, I might translate as the gradation of virtue. And again, what Aquinas called the gradation of values. And the idea is that we can grade human virtue. I mean, if you think about, say, the virtue of compassion. And I said to you, think about all the people you know. Who are the three most compassionate people you know? So you think about it for a while, and you tell me the names of three people that you think are really compassionate. You've, you've just, you've decided what compassion is about, and based on what, like, compassion ought to look like, you have chosen three people that are closest to that ideal of all the people that you know. And then if I said take those three people and rank them, who's most compassionate of those three, who's least compassionate of those three, and who would you put in the middle? Well, it might take, you know, some tedious work, but you could probably do that because you have this idea of a certain standard of what compassion is. And so Aquinas would, could say, would say you could do that with you know, mercy, justice, kindness, fairness, all kinds of virtues that we can grade in the same way that you've just graded compassion or graded people based on the standard of ultimate compassion. So what Aquinas goes on to say is that to do that, you have to have a standard. You have to have the perfect standard. When you take your uh, first exam here in this class, uh, you'll take the exam. But I can't grade the exam 
unless I have a perfect standard to compare yours to. If I don't have a standard, I can't grade it. But hopefully I'll have a perfect standard and I can compare your and all the other people in your class exams to that standard and grade your exam. As a matter of fact, I'll probably be able to print off a page that even ranks you by who got closest to my perfect standard and who got furthest from my perfect standard and how the rest of you ranked in between. You're graded by standard. So Aquinas says if you can grade virtue, then there must be some idea of a perfect standard for virtue, a perfect standard of compassion, a perfect standard of justice, a perfect standard of mercy, a perfect standard of loyalty. Again, he leaves open to what or who that standard might be. The fifth aspect of the cosmos that Aquinas talks about is the aspect of the design of the cosmos. And he, he says, you just, it just looks like there's design. And if, if there's design, it would seem there has to be, or you, what you would conclude is there has to be a designer. Design doesn't just happen. Some, something is behind design. There has to be a designer. So Aquinas goes through and he looks at these different aspects of the cosmos. Okay, seems like there has to be something, there has to be a first mover for all the motion. There has to be a first cause for all the substance. There has to be some, something that brought about an independent initial event from which everything else comes. There has to be a perfect standard for human virtue that we judge all human virtue by. And there has to be something that's behind the design that we assume there is in the universe. And so basically Aquinas says, so add it up. <laughs> what, what could, if undeniably there has to be these things in the cosmos, what is the source of all those things? What could have started the first movement? What could have created the first substance? What's the ultimate standard for virtue? What was the cause of the first event? And again, he's pointing to, it, it's, it's rational in his 13th century Western philosophical mind and in many people's 21st century mind, it's rational to say all of that equals God. Now certainly that's not what everybody would say, but that is what Aquinas says is a rational response to that question about these aspects of the cosmos. Now when we move up into more modern uh, or contemporary times, which again, in, as far as uh, philosophical history, we're talking about within the last few hundred years, uh, there's a couple people I want to introduce you to in regard to this topic. Uh, the first of those is William Paley. Uh, William Paley uh, was a philosopher from the late 18th, early 19th centuries. And what Paley did was he took the fifth element of Aquinas' cosmological argument, the divine designer. And he, he took that divine designer argument and he developed it in his own way. So he built on Aquinas' divine designer argument. And he developed what some call the watchmaker analogy. And, and he, really, he developed this uh, pretty elaborate analogy, again, to explain the divine designer argument in a different way. And, it, and again, obviously, uh, well, he's trying to say the same thing as, as Aquinas, that design implies a designer. And the major Reader's Digest version of his analogy is that he says, uh, one day you and a friend are walking through the woods. And uh, one of you bends down and you see something on the ground, you pick it up and you say, what is this? And your friend says, oh, that's a watch. And so you look at it and you go, hmm, I wonder where this came from. And uh, your friend begins to explain to you that it came together over a series of many years through natural processes. And eventually you got a watch through these natural processes. Well, you know, Klein, uh, Paley says, you'd say, well, that's crazy because look, it's got these hands and these cogs and stuff. I mean, something, it just, this isn't just by random events. Something had to design this. He says, you would assume that, that design demands a designer. And then Paley goes on to talk about some implications of that. You know, he says, if you look down and you realize that the watch didn't work right or didn't work at all, your conclusion would not probably be that there was no designer. Just like if you say, well, the cosmos doesn't really work right, so nobody designed it. Paley says, well, just because it doesn't work right doesn't mean it didn't have a designer. 
It might mean it didn't have a perfect designer. It might mean something got flawed in the design process. It might mean that once it was designed, something flawed it, something caused it to quit working. But you wouldn't assume no designer, even if it doesn't work right. So Paley elaborates on this divine designer argument. And as if you're thinking about the time frame of this, late 18th, early 19th century, you might also safely conclude that largely Paley developed this argument in response to Darwin's evolutionary theory. That this was his response to that, that no, there's design and, and it demands designer. Someone, a couple other people from the 19th and 20th centuries that I want to mention uh, talked about something that's often called the moral argument for God's existence or for the existence of a God. And two people that you often associate with this moral argument are, uh, first of all, Immanuel Kant. He was a 19th century philosopher. And secondly, one that you may be more familiar with, C.S. Lewis, a 20th century philosopher. Same guy that uh, if you've seen uh, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe from the Chronicles of Narnia. Same guy that wrote that. Uh, but he was also a philosopher on a lot of these questions of meaning and life. And uh, he built on Kant's moral argument. And I think the really interesting thing about these two men in relation to the moral argument is that Lewis was a believer in God and basically lived his life in response to that belief system. On the other hand, Kant was not. Uh, he, he was basically a humanist. He lived and died a humanist. And yet, as he looked at this aspect of morality and this moral component in humanity, he acknowledged that the easiest way to explain that would be that there's a moral God. So even as a non-believer, in a rational sense, he could see why it made sense to believe that there's a moral God. And some of the, there's a lot of ways that the moral arguments express, but some of the basic premises are, first of all, that moral facts exist. There are certain moral facts that exist. And let me go ahead and say the second one, then I'll say more about both those. And that these moral facts seem transcendental in nature. They, they seem like something that are, that, that these are moral facts that are imposed on us. That we didn't, we, we kind of operate with the mindset we didn't create these moral facts, but they are transcendental to us. A way that, that you might explain that is that if, um, if you were just dropped in another culture, in another time, you didn't know where you were, you didn't know the language people were speaking, you didn't know what era of time you were the, in, you were just dropped into this culture. And so you're there and you're looking around, you're trying to figure out what to do. Well, then this beat up old sort of jalopy bus comes by and there's a lot of different people riding on it and there's some chickens and goats hanging out the window and some stuff tied on top of it. And you think, well, that must be public transportation here. And you're out in the middle of nowhere, so you think, well, that's going somewhere with their civilization. So you get on. Well, you get on, and there's, there's one empty seat right there in front. So you sit down in that empty seat right there by the door. And you kind of look around, and, you know, there's people holding babies and people holding chickens and people holding goats, and there's old people, and, and there's you on this bus. Well, then you come to another stop, and there's a pretty crippled, decrepit old woman who's getting on this vehicle. She's all bent over. She can barely walk. She's got a cane. She can barely make the step up in. As a matter of fact, the driver helps her up. And she, out of breath, steps there and looks around. There's not an empty seat. What ought you to do? You know what you ought to do, right? Give up the seat. Now, maybe you're sitting there and you're thinking, but this is a different culture. This is a different time. Maybe they don't have the same value system. They're just going to sit here. What's the likelihood that you're, you're not giving up the seat would fly? <laughs> it's, it, it wouldn't. In every culture, there's, there's this moral fact that you are expected to buy into. And all those other people sitting on that bus holding babies and chickens and goats and there are old people, they're, lo they're all looking at you that you are the solution to this woman's dilemma. 
And if you don't move, you can't say, I didn't know the language. I didn't know where I was. I didn't know what era of time I was in. You really stand with no excuse. There's a moral fact that's transcendental in nature that you are expected to respond to in that situation by your own gut and intuition and by everybody sitting on that, whatever that vehicle is. <laughs> it's a moral fact that exists that's transcendental in nature. <clears throat> what what uh, both the humanist Kant and uh, the religious man Lewis say is that the best explanation of there being transcendental moral facts is provided by theism or the belief in a God. That there's something, you've got all these cultures that are disconnected, but there's certain moral facts that they all share and that they all believe anybody in that culture should adhere to, resident or visitor. So what unites, what, what's the source of this universal sense of morality? And again, both these men said the best explanation is provided by theism, belief that there's a God. Therefore, the existence of moral facts provides good grounds for thinking theism is true. Said both by someone who will definitely believe there was God or a God and someone who chose not to believe there was one but said if you're going to try to explain these transcendental moral facts, that would be the easiest way to explain it that there's a moral God that's a source of that. A final compulsion for belief in something else out there is really something that transcends all these time periods that we just talked about. And that is what some call the argument from special events. Or the argument based on something that uh, is often called in, in the field of religious studies, revelations, small r, not capital R, like the book of the New Testament. And what revelations are, are they are unexplainable events that are attributed to a supernatural source. Unexplainable events that we attribute to a supernatural source. Maybe what, what you would call a miracle. Something that's happened that you know it happened. You can't deny that it happened. But there's no rational explanation for it happening. Seems like something non-rational. Something non-natural had to cause this to happen, maybe something supernatural. And that compels belief in a lot of people. As a matter of fact, if, if probably for a lot of people, if you talk to a group of people who believe that there's something else out there, they've probably not come to that conclusion through some of these rational types of arguments we've just talked about. Most people probably come to that conclusion because they've had an experience that led them to undeniably believe there's something else out there, even if it doesn't seem rational, even if it doesn't make sense. It led them to believe there's something else out there that caused it, the argument from special events. Again, most people, if they paid attention to these rational arguments, that was probably later to bolster a belief system or to tear down a belief system. But most personal beliefs are that are really a belief that someone has in a, some sort of supreme divine entity is rooted in that something happened that caused them to undeniably accept there has to be something else out there because there's no other explanation for what just happened. Um, I use the example of something recently that happened in the news uh, here in this area was um, one morning, some men were out fishing in an area where they don't typically fish. And they heard this splash and kind of a commotion, and they thought, well, let's go see what's going on over there. And so they go to see what's going on, and what they see is, is a, uh, a man up on a bridge. And they begin to explore what seemingly he, what appeared to them he threw over the bridge, and it was a little girl. <laughs> And I believe she had a tire that he had tied to her to cause her to sink into the water. And so these men who were where they typically aren't and went and checked on something they probably wouldn't typically check on and happened to get there in time that they could still see someone above the bridge that had done something, managed to save this little girl. Well, a day or two later, I saw an interview on the news with this little girl's mother. And she said, 
this is miraculous that all this happened in the way it did to save my daughter's life. And she said, before this happened, I didn't know if there was a God or not. But now I know there's a God. <laughs> Something happened that in her mind she couldn't explain in any natural way except to say it was a miracle caused by God. I think even those two fishermen said the same thing after that experience. Something happened that they couldn't explain any other way, and it led to belief. Now, whether that sustains belief over time or not is another question, another issue, but it compelled belief initially. In the next lecture, we're going to look at one of the main reasons people choose not to believe that there's a God.